I'm excited to announce that the Short Coat Podcast has now joined the MedEd Media Network at MEDEDmedia.com. The Short Coat Podcasts are broadcasts from the amazing and intense world of medical school from the students at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. Go check them out directly at theshortcoat.com. The pre-med year, session number 223. Hello and welcome to the two-time Academy Award-nominated podcast, The Pre-Med Years, where we believe that collaboration, not competition, is key to your success. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we share with you stories, encouragement, and information that you need to know to help guide you on your path to becoming a physician. A welcome to The Pre-Med Years. If this is your first time joining us here, thank you for taking some time out of your day. Today, I have a very special guest, someone who has been helping physicians and maybe more people outside of physicians for a while online in the financial space. Physicians make a decent amount of money, but still seem to struggle with paying bills. And I'm going to talk all about that with Jim and discuss what he has learned, and how he is helping physicians manage their money and hopefully show you as you are on your journey to medical school that it is possible. You just need to set yourself up for success and do things intentionally. Too often in this life, no matter if it's financial or or anything else, we let things happen to us and we aren't intentional enough about those things, about anything, really. And a lot of what Jim talks about is just being intentional. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Jim, welcome to the pre-med years. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So you are an emergency medicine physician. When along your journey through life did you realize that that medicine was your calling? Well, I don't know when I definitely realized it. I remember taking a survey in eighth grade that suggested I should be a doctor, Um, but I don't think I really decided on it until my junior year of college. I remember a conversation with my father, and I said, Dad, if I I become a doctor, I'm going to be at least 31 before I get out and get a real job. And he said, you know what? You're going to be 31 then no matter what you're doing. You might as well figure out what you want to do and do that. And that was good advice. Uh, You know, from my perspective, 31 seemed really old. Well, now 31 seems very young. And uh, that time spent investing in this career was a uh, was a wise uh, investment. It turns out, isn't it so funny? I, I I find it hilarious when I talk to to college students and we talk about a gap year, maybe to strengthen their application, and they're like, oh, "I can't take a year off. It's just a year that I, I need." I'm like, "A year in the grand scheme of things is nothing." Right. That's exactly right. But you, I think it takes a few years under your belt to really get that perspective. Yeah. When you've only been alive for 20 years, it, it seems like a year's a long time. Yeah. Did So you were in college at this point, uh, not pre-med? You were... No, I was pre-med the whole time in college. You yeah. know, there, I, I had a pretty good idea that's where I was going, but I wasn't really committed to it, I think, until then. And that was when I started studying for the MCAT. Okay. So you, um, you kind of had but one foot in. Yeah, I came into college, you know, interested in science and, and um, you know, studying all the stuff that relates to medicine. It turns out the more it related to medicine, the more interested in it I was. So this wasn't a huge surprise. That's kind of the way I was heading. I think I just had, at that point, had gotten some more information about the career and was really trying to decide whether whether to go for it or not. What do you think would have held you back from it? Well, I think part of it is that I didn't see anything else I thought I would be happy doing. You know, a lot of doctors discourage pre-meds from going into medicine. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some wisdom in the statement that if you can be talked out of it, you should be. Um, Because you really take so much commitment to get through the long training pipeline that if there's something else on your back burner in the back of your mind that you think you would really be enjoying – um, you know, when you get to those 80 hour work weeks in residency, that's what you're going to be thinking about. Uh, whereas if there's nothing else that you want to do as much as medicine, 
um, you're going to be fully committed to it and you're going to have the commitment you need to make it through. Yeah. So you, you studied for the MCAT. Did you uh, go straight from college to medical school? I did. I mean, I had four months off, three months off, yeah. something like that. But yeah, basically straight through. I took a couple of years off as an undergraduate and spent a little bit of time on a mission uh, down in Arizona. So I had a couple of years off between my freshman and my sophomore year. Um, and that was where I kind of uh, developed a drive to really help other people. And so combining that with my interest in science made medicine a natural fit once I came back. Plus, I was a heck of a lot better at studying at that point. And, you know, getting the A's required to get into medical school was a lot easier at that point. <laughs> A's are important. Grades are important. What was the hardest thing for you going through your undergrad Jewett path to get into medical school? I think the worst part about being an undergraduate is the competitiveness. I found medical school and residency to be far more collegial than undergraduate ever was. I mean, it just felt like everyone was out to get you, you know, just very competitive. And I think the reason for that was I went to a college that sends out 250 or 300 people to medical school, well, not to medical school, but applying to medical school every year. And so there was lots of people around and it felt very competitive. Uh, Utah is a, an exporter of medical students. You know, we send medical students all over the country. And so I think that was probably the worst part. It just felt competitive uh, as opposed to when I got into medical school. Um, you know, it didn't feel like I was competing with anybody. We were just all trying to learn medicine together. How did you shield yourself from it? From the competitiveness? Yeah. Oh, I don't know that I did or that I could have. Um, I think all I did was realize, well, this is what I want to do and I'm going to, um, you know, do the best I can on my grades. I'm going to do the best I can on the MCAT and, you know, and then I tried to explore my other interests. You know, I was playing on a, uh, intercollegiate hockey, hockey team at the time. And so I was spending a lot of time doing that and a lot of time, you know, pursuing interests and spending time with friends. And, uh, and then by my senior year, I was engaged to be married. And so, um, you know, I think I just explored other interests and realized that this was this was part of my career path. There was going to be a couple of years where it was going to be really competitive and um, and just deal with it. I think I'm not sure you can really get away from the fact that something like two thirds of those who apply to medical school don't get in. I mean, those statistics are just what they are. It's it's a competitive thing to do. And that's actually the most competitive part of the entire process is just getting into a medical school somewhere. Yeah. Yep. I agree. And one of the reasons for this show is the cutthroat nature of some online sources out there. And, and I, I preach collaboration and not competition on this podcast because my, my theory and looking at the numbers is that there are enough seats available in medical school for those that deserve it, whether that's deserving it because of their grades and MCAT score, or, or obviously those are huge factors in it, but deserve it because they've they've done the shadowing and, and extracurriculars and clinical experience and they've even though there's no checklist to get into medical school they've checked enough of those boxes uh, there are so many students that apply to medical school even today that that really don't know what the process is and so they're applying blindly and absolutely absolutely i agree the percentage is much lower for someone who actually understands the process uh, as far as percentage of people not getting into medical school. And the truth is you can collaborate with all of those people around you because you're not competing with the guy sitting next to you in organic chemistry to get a slot into medical school. Yep. You're competing with hundreds of other people across the country. You might as well collaborate with him. There's nothing <laughs> keeping both of you from getting into medical school, even the same medical school. Exactly. Awesome. I love hearing that. So you you go into medical school. What was that transition like going from playing sports in college and and studying and doing all that stuff that you did in college and then and then getting slapped in the face with medical school? Well, it was awesome. I mean, <laughs> med medical school is the best four years, uh, maybe not the best four years of my life, but certainly four of the greatest years of my life. There's no doubt about it. I loved it. I loved the whole time. I loved what I was studying. I loved the friends I was making. I loved the activities I was doing. I was newly married, but we didn't have children. I mean, everything about it was great. Truly, I loved medical school. Now, there was a slap in the face that came a couple of months in, about the time I got my first grade back on a gross anatomy test and did not do nearly as well as I had thought and realized I needed to up my game. 
and basically I just needed to spend more time studying and a little bit less time playing. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think that happens to everybody. You realize you're going from college where maybe you're taking 15 or 16 credit hours to a load that's maybe the equivalent of 25 credit hours as a medical student. It just requires some more time put in. Yeah. When along the path did you realize that emergency medicine was what you wanted to do? Well, I thought it was going to be a family doc coming into medical school. Um, but I think it was probably during one of those lunch and learns they have during your first couple of years where they drag in a specialist and he tells you all about his specialty in his life. And, uh, and they had an emergency doc come in and I said, Hey, that guy's just like me. And, um, and from there I had a pretty good idea. That was what I wanted to do. Uh, of course, I didn't really know for sure until I rotated in emergency medicine, uh, late in my third year. Uh, and that pretty much confirmed it for me that that was going to be the best fit for me. I wish I'd taken a little bit closer look at anesthesia than I did. For some reason, I put anesthesia into this category with other stuff like pathology and radiology, that those guys weren't real doctors. And uh, I think I would have enjoyed anesthesia as well. So uh, I don't know that I would have picked it over emergency medicine, but I think I should have taken a little bit closer look at it because I think it would have fit me well. What about it do you think would have fit you? I like the, uh, I like the procedures. I like the opportunity to take care of critically ill people as well as take care of some uh, emergencies. Um, I would enjoy, I think, the um, uh, you know short-term relationship, but uh, concentrated relationship at a critical time in people's lives. Uh, I think those are all aspects of, of anesthesia I would have enjoyed. Yeah. What do you think the the future of emergency medicine it's it's funny i have the specialty stories podcast and i had an emergency medicine doc on and we talked about the future of emergency medicine but i'm interested to hear your your outlook on where emergency medicine is going i think emergency medicine isn't going anywhere uh, i mean it's one of the probably the last specialty of medicine that could be outsourced to uh, you know a, a foreign country you know, maybe somebody in India is going to be reading our CT scans soon, but I don't think they're going to be taking care of people in the emergency department. So I think there's lots and lots of job security there. In fact, uh, among emergency departments, uh, there's still a huge percentage of emergency medicine jobs that aren't filled by a board certified emergency physician just because there aren't enough board certified emergency physicians to fill them. And so I think the demand for, for the skills of an emergency physician is going to be there for a long, long time. Now, one of the biggest threats to the field is the corporate practice of emergency medicine. There are some large uh, groups that uh, they actually trade on the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, you can buy shares in them that basically, you know, buy up contracts with hospitals throughout the country and then own the emergency docs as their employees. And so when the, when the physician generates a fee, they skim off some percentage of it for their profits and their expenses uh, and then pay the, the physician uh, a lower rate. And the problem with that is the physician loses control of his practice. He doesn't get to control how many patients per hour he's seeing. He doesn't get to control who his coworkers are. Um, he doesn't get to control how he's paid and when he's paid and how vacations are taken and, and what the shift differentials are. So I think we're seeing a trend where there are fewer and fewer emergency physicians who actually own their job. And I think that's bad for doctors and bad for patients. But is the actual practice of emergency medicine going anywhere? No, I don't think so. It's going to be here for a long time and it's only getting stronger. You are the creator of the White Coat <clears throat> Investor and whitecoatinvestor.com. Talk to me about your journey into medicine from the mindset of money. At, at what point did you ever, if you ever, did you look at the cost of going to medical school and, and question whether or not it was worth it? Well, I certainly did that. It's kind of funny in retrospect, and everybody listening to this is probably going to get a laugh out of this story. But I came from a family with six kids. My dad was an engineer. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. Um, we were certainly middle class, um, but not, you know, we weren't poor. We always had food to eat. And um, we, uh, you know, I, we all kind of knew that we were supposed to go to college. That was what our, uh, our parents instilled in us from a young age. Um, but when it came time to go to college, there were no resources coming from my parents uh, to uh, provide for that education. It was going to be on us. 
So we could either get scholarships or we could take loans or we could work our way through. And so, you know, most of us did some combination of that in college. Um, but when it came time to start looking at medical school, I looked at the expense and I really was debt averse. I did not want to have that debt from college. I mean, the tuition at my college when I was a pre-med student or the tuition at the medical school, uh, the local medical school when I was an undergraduate was 8000 a year. <laughs> I mean, that was really expensive. And uh, so I couldn't imagine taking on all that debt. And so I actually signed on with the military. And they got me for a song because <laughs> obviously, even though tuition went up in the few years I was in medical school, I think by the time I got out in state tuition was only twelve or thirteen thousand dollars a year. So they got me for a really good deal with the military. And that's how I paid for med school. They gave me a stipend. I think it was nine hundred and thirty dollars a month while I was in medical school and paid for all my books and fees and tuition. And then when I came out of residency, I owed them four years of active duty. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because they call that a scholarship, mm -hmm. whereas in reality, I, I'm not sure scholarship is the right word for it. Indentured it, servitude. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, they get their money back because they just pay you less than you'd make if you were out in the private practice world. Yeah. And so you get your money earlier in the process, but I don't know that you necessarily come out ahead. I once ran the numbers on my situation and figured I came out about $180,000 behind by going through the military. But these days with tuition being much more expensive, and especially if you're in a specialty that doesn't pay as well, um, you know, you can certainly come out ahead financially by having the military pay rather than taking out loans, um, especially if you don't have a way to pay off your loans within four years of coming out of residency. Well, at least going through the military, your loans would be gone after four years. Yeah. Um, so it, it's not a bad option, but I would not recommend anybody go into the military just for money. The primary reason you go in has to be a desire to serve or you will be miserable in the military. And many physicians in the military are miserable and are counting the days until they can get out. <laughs> My sentiments, exactly. I don't know if you know, I, I was an HPSB student myself going through uh -huh. the Air Force. So what, what okay. branch did you serve through? I, I was in the Air Force. I was active duty from 2006 to 2010. There you go. All right. So two Air Force docs, former Air Force docs. Do you, are you guard or reserves anymore? Or did you I, cut all ties? I am not. I'm completely out, cut all ties. Yeah. So right. it was a, you know, it, it, I don't know that I didn't have any great experiences in the military because I certainly did. And I enjoyed the camaraderie and I enjoyed being able to practice medicine on four different continents in four years. Um, but if I had to uh, do it again, I probably would have chosen the loans. Interesting. Yeah. And, and I think it, it'd be interesting. Do you have that math anywhere of, of that, that kind of break even point of, if if your loans are are X number of dollars, uh, then military would be good for you. Or if they're they're lower, then then you shouldn't do it. Well, I mean, it, it all varies, right? It's all garbage in, garbage out. Anytime yeah. you're doing a calculation like that. But the bottom line, if you're going into primary care and you're going to an expensive medical school, you're going to come out ahead financially by going through the military. If you're going to an inexpensive medical school and you're going to be an orthopedist, you're going to come out behind going into the military. Yeah. Uh, and the rest of us are somewhere in the middle yeah. and, you know, and it, it may work out OK. It just really depends. Yeah. Part of the issue, though, is just the fact that tuition has gone nuts the last few years. And uh, and it's unbelievable the debt burden some students are coming out with these days. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that that equation also needs to take into account whether or not you can actually match in the specialty that you want through the military. Absolutely. The biggest downside of going through the military is the military match. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a downside. In some specialties, it's easier to match in the military match than it is in the regular match, such as dermatology. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, it's just different. And people need to understand that if you sign up with the military, you will be going through the military match. And that means uh, that, you know, it might be much harder to match into your chosen specialty. For example, emergency medicine is a tough match yeah. in the military. Lots of people in the military want to go into emergency medicine. And I don't know if that's just because the same people that are adventure enough to go, adventurous enough to go into the military uh, are, you know, adventurous enough to be in emergency medicine or what the correlation there is. But I think the match rate the year I applied was like 50%. Yeah. I mean, it was terrible. Whereas it was 93% in the civilian match. Wow. Big difference. Yeah. Where did your interest in finances come from? It came from being ripped off. 
I mean, seriously, I had no interest as an undergraduate in business or finance. I took no classes in any of that stuff as an undergraduate. Got into medical school and really didn't have much interest there either. When I came out into residency and started actually earning a paycheck, which I thought was a pretty good paycheck. I was getting paid $37,000 a year. And, uh, and I was feeling pretty good about that. And then realized that I just kept getting ripped off over and over and over again by financial professionals. You name it, I've been ripped off by them. I've been ripped off by a realtor, a mortgage lender, an appraiser, an insurance agent, a financial advisor. And finally, I just hit the straw that broke the camel's back. And I said, if I don't start learning about this stuff, I'm just going to continue to be taken advantage of throughout my career. So luckily, I lived almost next door to a used bookstore, and I started walking over there from time to time and buying financial books, and I'd read them. And after about 20 books, I realized, well, this stuff isn't that complicated. I can learn this. This is way easier than learning pulmonology or nephrology or anything like that. And I started participating online with, uh, you know, forums and blogs. And after a while, I realized I was doing a lot more teaching than I was learning. And I got sick of typing the same thing over and over again into the Internet. So I figured if I started a blog, I could just post a link to my blog where I'd previously addressed that issue. And I realized as well that almost no doctors were getting this training, uh, you know, this financial knowledge as part of their education and training. And uh, and that literally I knew more than any other doctor I knew about it. And so that was kind of the birth of the White Coat Investor in 2011. I started the website and it just took off immediately because the need was so huge. And it's continued to grow year after year since that, since then. And it's been a pretty exciting journey to watch just how much it's grown and uh, how many people I've been able to help with it. Yeah, that's phenomenal. Why, why do you think it's so important specifically for physicians to have this knowledge? Well, I think it's important for a few reasons. One, because I want physicians to be financially secure because it makes them better doctors. Um, but they're, they're kind of a setup to be taken advantage of for a few reasons. One, they are very idealistic and trusting of other professionals. Just like when we call up a GI specialist and we know he's going to come in and do the right thing for the patient, we assume every other professional in every other field works the same way. And in financial services, it just doesn't work that way. People don't go into becoming a financial advisor or an insurance agent for the same reason that you went to medical school. There is no uh, essay where they talk about how they just want to help people and how much they love science. You know, it just doesn't exist in financial services. And so you have to really be a lot more skeptical, especially when you realize that you have a target on your back by virtue of your high income when you finish residency. And there are a lot of people that want a piece of that. And so I think that's really the, the key is to realize that you got no training on this stuff, that there are people who literally want to take advantage of you and that you can't be too trusting of the financial world out there or you will be taken advantage of. Yeah. And, and I think hopefully it's with today's day and age with what's in the news and the fiduciary uh, rules that are being withdrawn or, or canceled or whatever you want to call it. Um, where where these these professionals that are supposed to be giving us good advice don't necessarily have to give us good advice for us. Exactly. Why is this even a debate? Shouldn't this be a given that when you're going to somebody and paying them for advice that they're giving you the best possible advice for you? I mean, it's ridiculous that this discussion is even taking place. Yeah. It's it's uh, it's kind of silly, but it is what it is and and having that knowledge is is what empowers us to move forward. So I, That's exactly I think, right. Uh, and, I it's, think, and it's becoming more important as, you know, downward pressures on salaries and many specialties are occurring. And as upward pressures in, in medical school tuition uh, are also pressuring doctors. I mean, I just cannot believe what, what some doctors are facing as they start their career as far as uh, uh, debt burdens. Yeah. You mentioned earlier when you were talking about your your kind of thought process now looking back at it of, of choosing the, the health profession scholarship for the military of if, if you aren't able to pay off your loans within four years of graduating, talk about that for a minute. I, I wouldn't know anybody who's able to pay off loans within four years. Well, the key to paying off your student loans 
in a short time period after residency is to live like a resident while you're making an attending salary. So it works like this. Let's say you come out and you're making $250,000, but you're still living that same lifestyle you had when you were making $50,000 as a resident. You'll pay a little more in taxes, but even after tax, you're still going to be freeing up a six-figure amount that can be used to build wealth. That can be used to max out retirement accounts. It can be used to save up a down payment on your dream home, and it can be used to pay off your student loans. And so if you will maintain that discipline coming out of residency for two to five years after residency, you can have your student loans paid off. You can catch up to your college roommates as far as retirement savings goes, and you can have a down payment saved up for your dream house. But the problem is too many doctors come out of residency and immediately grow into that attending income. They just cannot resist the siren call of that additional income. And before they know it, they've grown all the way into their income or even past their income. It seems unbelievable to a pre-med that this could happen, that if someone could spend $300,000 a year. Uh, but I assure you it happens all the time to physicians just because they're busy and they're not paying attention and they don't deliberately have a financial plan when they come out of residency. You know, when you're, if, if you're having trouble living within your means on $200,000, the problem isn't that you don't earn enough. It's a spending problem. Lifestyle inflation. Yeah. You, well, I mean, a little bit of lifestyle inflation is fine. It's yeah. the lifestyle explosion <laughs> upon coming out of residency that you've got to avoid. The lifestyle you know, I mean, big bang. Exactly. It's. I mean, even if you want to increase your lifestyle from $50,000 a year to $75,000 a year, I mean, that's a 50% raise. That would be huge in corporate America. <laughs> um, but, you know, what you can't do is, is go from $50,000 a year to $200,000 a year and expect to get those loans paid off anytime soon. Yeah. Do you think, what do you think causes that desire? So, so talking to a pre-med student right now, how would you instruct him or her to to prevent those those desires and that that kind of pull to to have that lifestyle inflation or explosion? Well, I think you've got to realize that it's totally natural and that if you don't do anything, that's what's going to happen. And the other key, I think, is to literally have a written plan, even if it's one page, but a written plan of what you're going to do with your first 12 months of attending paychecks before you ever walk out of residency. Because the problem is by the time most docs graduate from residency, they've got two car payments and a mortgage that can only be paid on an attending salary before they even have earned a single paycheck. You know, there are banks that will give you a, a doctor mortgage uh, without you even showing proof of income. All you have to have is a contract. And so before you ever start making the income, you've already got it spent. And so I think the key is just to have that written plan ready to go when you become an attendee, because the secret isn't to pinch a few pennies as a resident. Um, it might not even be pinching a few pennies as a medical student to keep your debt levels down. The key is what you do with those first few years of attending paycheck. I I like it. I, I don't think I've ever heard of it in those terms, but it, it it's easy for me to think of because I I'm a big sports guy. And so I always. You always hear football teams coming out with their first like quarter of play is already set in stone and then they and then they adjust as necessary after that. So it's very similar to what you're talking about. In your mind, knowing that that medical school tuition is so much money, what what do you say to a pre med student to reassure him or her that it's okay or that it will all be okay? At, at, on the other side, um, that they'll they'll make enough money to pay it back, and and they'll they'll be uh, living a lifestyle that is okay at least for a while. Well, I think it's important not to give them false reassurance to start with. I think probably somewhere around ten to twenty five percent of physicians are not okay. They really aren't. They come out of medical school owing four hundred thousand dollars and they take a job paying $180,000. And the fact remains that if they want to get rid of that debt anytime soon, they're basically gonna be living a lifestyle similar to what they did as a resident uh, for a, quite a long time. And, um, and you know, I'm starting to see people having really outrageous amounts of debt. I ran a post on my blog a few uh, weeks ago, 
And at that time, my record for a single medical student's debt upon completion of training was $635,000. Within six hours after running that post, I've heard of someone who had $665,000, someone who had $800,000, someone who had $950,000, and somebody who had $1.1 million. Now, when you're talking about those kinds of extreme debts, uh, income of $200,000 a year just isn't enough to take care of that. And so I think the key is to not become one of those uh, extreme situations with a very low income and a very high debt load. But the vast majority of doctors are still going to be okay, even racking up the average amount of debt and having an average physician income. Uh, my general guideline I give to people is to not borrow more than twice what their uh, gross income will be after residency. So if they're going into family practice and they expect to make $200,000 a year, they've got to keep their debt burden below $400,000 and preferably a lot closer to $200,000. If they get much above there, they're going to have a very hard time paying it off. And it's not going to be anywhere near the lifestyle you thought you were going to have as a physician. Um, but on the other end, I still meet lots and lots of doctors who are coming out and depending on the specialty, might be making two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars, and and they've got a debt burden of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They're going to be able to clean that up very, very quickly. Um, and so I think the key is just keep those two factors in mind and not let them get too out of balance. But at the same time, I don't think the message can be that you can borrow any amount of money and you make so much money as a physician that you can take care of it later. That just isn't the case. And, and the people who think that and end up going to an expensive medical school in an expensive place to live and pay for their spouse and a couple of kids with loans and then expect to be able to clear all that debt rapidly upon completion of residency, um, especially in some of the lower paying fields, that, that's just not going to work out well for them. It's, it sounds like a lot of your advice and your, your information is based on the fact that obviously the goal is to pay down the debt as fast as possible to, to make the interest as low as possible. Is, what's wrong with coming out with a lot of debt if somebody has to? And going into a family practice field, because that's what they're driven to do, and they pay off their loans in 30 years. Well, the main issue with it is that, um, you know, when, when I came out of medical school in 2003, a lot of my classmates refinanced their loans at 0.9%. I mean, literally, they were paying it back with dollars that were worth less uh, than the dollars that they had taken the loans out in due to inflation. But medical student, medical, uh, uh, well, doctors who are coming out of residency these days, they have loans that are 5.6, 6.8, 8 8%, 10%, I saw the other day from somebody who went to one of the Caribbean medical schools. Mm. And when your uh, debt is compounding at those kinds of interest rates, that's likely your best investment. Dragging that sort of that sort of a thing out over 30 years is going to turn it into an astronomical sum of money to pay back. And so I think the key is to get your debt paid off quickly, not to drag it out over time. Because I can assure you that five or 10 years out of residency, you will not be nearly as excited about practicing medicine as you are as a pre-medical student. You will start looking at ways in which you can uh, perhaps change your practice, perhaps go part-time, uh, perhaps have more vacation, maybe even retire early. And those sorts of things will be much more important to you then than they are now. But the problem is, by borrowing large sums of money now, you're basically stealing money from future you. And future you might not appreciate that so much if he starts having different views on life than what you have. <laughs> and future you might have access to a time machine. We don't know where technology is going, so be careful. That's right. You'll come back and punch you in the nose for borrowing all that money. Stop doing that, future me. I mean, I think I think a good case can be made still for paying for a medical school education uh, with student loans, uh, but it's got to be coupled with a plan to actually pay off the cost of that education. You're really not done with medical school until you paid for it, 
And if you change your mind and decide this isn't really what I want to do, I want to be a ski instructor or I want to be a river guide, um, <laughs> you're stuck if you owe $400,000 in student loans. There's nothing else you are trained to do that can pay you enough to pay for the interest on those loans, let alone pay them down other than practicing medicine. And so having that freedom to do what you want to do um, is pretty important. And the way to get that is to get those loans paid off before you get used to the income. And bankruptcy is not a solution because educational loans are not um, part of a bankruptcy filing. That's absolutely right. They do not go away. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, if you really want to carry them for a long time, you will learn that they garnish social security payments to make your federal student loan payments. Mm. What do you, what have you seen or what is your sense uh, beyond taking out too many loans or, or not paying them off and having this lifestyle inflation? What, what is the, the biggest mistake that you see physicians making with their money? Well, I think the biggest problem is that they just spend too much of it. Um, they make a lot of other uh, mistakes as well. One of them is not realizing, and this isn't specific to physicians, this is for everybody, but not realizing that we live in a 401k world and they have a second job where they want to learn anything about it or not as a pension fund manager. Nobody else is going to be managing your retirement funds for you. You've got to do it yourself. So I suggest you learn how to do it relatively early in your career um, so that you can take advantage of those things. I ran into a, an emergency physician at a conference uh, a couple of years ago. He was 63 years old and had a net worth of $300,000. So after 30 years of physician-level paychecks, that was all he had to show for it. And that was just because he'd never learned anything about how to manage money. He'd never had the discipline to carve out a significant chunk of his income uh, and save it for retirement. And, and basically, it was too late at this point. I mean, what do you tell him? At this point, he's going to be mostly living on Social Security, despite living on a physician-level income for his entire working career. Where can – actually, I want to I wanna switch gears. How can we get financial information, financial knowledge, financial teaching into, into a medical – school curriculum because we we're training people to come out and and heal people and there's all this information out there but we're also training people that are going to have high incomes as they progress forward in their career so i i think it's it's it should be mandatory to have some sort of financial education while in medical school how how would you pitch that to to the uh to the ACGME or whoever's uh the LCME the the people that are accrediting schools? Well, I haven't tried pitching it to the to them yet, but I have tried pitching it to the individual schools. And uh, and there certainly is some interest in it. I mean, when these guys are getting paid $50,000 a year in tuition, I think they can take $100 a student and put it toward, uh, you know, a course that will teach them how to manage uh, their future business. Because we're not just training physicians, we're also training businessmen. I mean, a medical practice is a business. And if you don't know anything about business, uh, that medical practice may not uh, be able to be around long enough to take care of patients. You know, no, uh, no margin, no mission. Um, but there are, there is at least one medical school that has successfully incorporated a business of medicine class into its fourth year curriculum. It's an optional class um, at the University of Arkansas. Um, where basically the students take, uh, it's an evening class, but it's an hour or two, once a week in the evening for about three months. And they're taught all this stuff. They're taught about personal finance and investing and the business of medicine and insurance and how it works and all those kinds of things. And it's not that hard to implement. And so I would hope to see a lot of other medical schools incorporate that class. But for a class that's optional, I think something like 65% of the students in the class are taking it. Um, so obviously there's a heavy, heavy interest among medical students to get this information early in their career. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. And I'm very excited that it's a, an SEC school since I'm a SEC grad <laughs> myself, <laughs> even though it's Arkansas, it's okay. Um, Jim, where can people go and find everything that you're doing online? Well, the easiest place to start is at whitecoatinvestor.com. Um, I have a forum there. I have a blog there. I've just started a podcast, as we discussed earlier. 
Uh, also, I have a book called The White Coat Investor. Um, but now, after I've been doing this for a few years, there are some other bloggers out there who are also trying to get information into the hands of doctors on financial topics. And so that's good to see. I'm happy to see it. It's you know, probably more collaborative than competitive for me, uh, but it certainly helps to fulfill my mission to help those who wear the white coat get a fair shake on Wall Street. Um, but that's probably some of the best places. There are some other good internet forums out there as well for those interested in real estate investing. Bigger Pockets has a, has a nice forum. For those interested in uh, mutual fund investing, the best forum is probably bogleheads.org. Um, but there's lots of places online. If you just get out there and start learning this stuff, you'll, you'll be surprised how easy it is to learn and, uh, and actually implement yourself without having to pay thousands of dollars a year to a financial advisor. What are your last words of wisdom for the pre-med staring at their undergrad loans and looking at what medical school is going to cost and, and questioning whether or not it's worth it? Well, it certainly is a wonderful career. I really enjoy taking care of patients. At this point in my career, I'm financially independent and don't have to go to the hospital and take care of patients, but I still do because I love it. What I'd like to see is more doctors practicing medicine because they love it and not because they have to. And by taking care of your finances early in your career, you can be in that position as well, surprisingly early in your career. All right. Again, that was Dr. Jim Dolly. He can be found at whitecoatinvestor.com. We'll have links to everything in our show notes at medicalschoolhq.net slash 223. I want to take a second and thank the people that have taken the time to leave us a rating and review in iTunes. We have one from Naruto Rocks that says, my number one resource. So thankful that I have this podcast to rely on with the many questions I have as a pre-med. Thank you for that. We have another one here from D from NYMC. It says, awesome and very helpful. All the podcasts are packed with lots of information drawn from the vast experiences and perspectives of the individuals invited by Dr. Gray, the majority of whom are doctors or med students. Thank you for that review. If you'd like to leave us a rating and review, you can do so at medicalschoolhq.net slash iTunes. We have one more here from Chakapow, <laughs> Chowkapow, I think. It says, inspiring. If you are considering a career change to medicine, this is the podcast for you. MSHQ brings quality stories and concise answers to your questions and doubts. Thank you for that. Again, medicalschoolhq.net slash iTunes if you'd like to leave a rating and review. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast and I hope that the discussion with Jim will help ease some of your fears with going to medical school and getting into debt and on the other side, paying off that debt. Yes, there are challenges if you allow some of those things to creep up on you, but if you are intentional about everything that you're doing, then you should be okay. Have a great week, and we'll catch you next time here at the Pre-Med Years and MedEd Media.